Today on Missing Link. What could a mask have to do with hearing? Where is the connection between listening equipment and elephants? How could pachyderms be associated with cooling towers? And where's the link between power stations and cramps? There aren't any links? Oh yes there are, you just have to look really hard. Missing Link Elzach, 30 kilometers northeast of Freiburg in the Black Forest. The town with just 3,000 inhabitants is famous for its carnival. The traditional masks are a major feature of this festival. They are called Laven in the local dialect. One of the craftsmen who makes these masks is Adrian Burger. I'm a wood sculptor by profession, and one of my specialties is making masks. We masqueraders call the Elzach masks Laven, but that name is actually used in the whole region. The Fastnacht Carnival is part of our tradition, and it's certainly part of my life, not because of my job, but simply because I'm from Elzach, and the Elzach Fastnacht is a very special thing. I feel I'm upholding the tradition with my hand-sculpted masks, because they're not produced by machine. Each one is unique, tailor-made for the person who will wear it. He finds the ideal material for his masks in the woods, lime wood. It's at least 60 centimeters in diameter. You can make masks for the whole procession. The tree costs him 225 euros. Now the real work can begin, carving the mask. I make the larven here in my workshop. They're one-off pieces carved from a single block according to the customer's instructions. They're individually designed and painted so that the finished article is ready to be worn at the carnival. Limewood is a classic choice for wood carving, and the great sculptor Tilman Riemenschneider used it for many of his greatest works. The block of wood is gradually turned into a realistic looking face. Adrian Burger earns his living making masks. His customers come from all over the world. His handmade larven can even be found in museums in North and South America. What makes the Elzach larven special is that they're not just hung on a nail as lifeless ornaments. They are the centerpiece of the lively annual Fastnacht celebrations when they're worn by the masqueraders. There are seven basic designs for Elzach masks. There are comic masks, friendly masks or animal masks, and all of them have very long tradition. But there are also sinister, demonic masks that have a grim, wicked appearance. They are designed to terrify the onlookers. There's a broad range of different masks and most of them are designed individually. Finally, it's time for the Fastnacht celebrations and the masqueraders wander through the street in their masks. No one's allowed to know who's hiding behind each larven because anonymity is highly prized among the Black Forest Carnival masqueraders. Hearing is one of our five senses. When your hearing is damaged or limited, technological aids are used to combat the problem. But what do masks have to do with our sense of hearing? Hearing, it's one of our five senses. It used to be even more important, warning of looming danger, if a saber-toothed tiger was looking for lunch. Today's hearing prime role is in communication and relaxation. People just love to hear music and since the 1980s we've been able to do so whilst on the move, then courtesy of the Walkman cassette player. But compared to the MP3 players of today, they were massive. Hang on, MP3? What is MP3? Well, it's a method that allows digital sound to be made smaller without our ears being able to hear any difference in quality. It works like this. Our ears can hear very soft noises, such as a pin drop. But they can also hear very loud noises, like a jackhammer. What they can't do, though, is to hear both at the same time, nor one directly after the other. The louder sound masks the quieter one. 
so if you can't hear the masked pin drop, then you don't need to worry about recording it. In this way, the amount of data needed to be stored is reduced by the MP3 algorithm. Classical musicians are no fans of MP3, though. They largely would prefer to decide for themselves what bits of the music to hear and not leave that choice to an algorithm. To which we say, hear, hear. For years, Michael Schwaninger was only able to read lips, catching snippets of conversation and piecing them together, despite using a hearing aid. That changed in 2001. He now understands everything, thanks to a surgically inserted cochlear implant, or CI. Without this device, he'd probably never have managed to become a department head at a pharmaceutical company. Yet he spent years struggling through school and a business administration degree, trying at all costs not to draw attention to himself and to disappear into the masses. My hearing loss began during puberty, in about my sixth or seventh year of school. As a result, I tried to sit as close to the front as possible, to be as near the speaker as I could get. You try to use hearing and communication tactics to conceal the problem. There's no reputation associated with hearing impairment like there is, say, with wearing glasses. Wearing glasses makes people seem intellectual. Wearing a hearing aid, per se, makes you seem dumb or slow. People with a hearing impairment are not looked up to in our society, and that makes it difficult for people who are hard of hearing to be open about their disability. As a university student, he led an increasingly isolated social existence as well. You see others going out to the disco or to the cinema, enjoying life, and notice the focus of your own world getting smaller and smaller. By focus I mean your circle of friends, your social surroundings. You maybe get invited to a party and you don't go, and then you might get invited a second time, but the third time they don't invite you anymore. Not being able to hear is extremely restricting. Now he can hear again, thanks to his cochlear implant, a device that's been in use in Germany for 25 years. Let me take off the CI, the speech processor. Here in the front is a microphone, this is the processor and this is the power supply. All the audible sounds picked up by this microphone are transformed into electrical impulses, which are then transmitted to this coil that relays the signal to an implant that's fitted underneath the skin. You can see there's a magnet here on the outside and there's one on the inside, so it holds firmly on this spot. The information is transmitted to the inside via the magnetic link. This information is fed into the cochlea as electrical impulses and is then directly sent on to the brain. On average, a CI procedure on one ear costs 40,000 euros, paid for by German health insurance. He also managed to get a second implant, which allows him to hear as well as he possibly can. This currently is a borderline situation. When the train rolls through with cars and a moped driving by, plus all the other background noises mixing in with those other sounds, it's at moments like that I have a really hard time differentiating sounds from each other and processing them. That's really bothersome, as it probably is for someone with normal hearing too. But that is where the CI's effectiveness is limited. Many doors have opened to me since I've had the implants, yet I still consider myself hearing impaired because there are still situations where I can't hear as well as someone with normal hearing. When I'm in a loud environment, like in the shower or when I go swimming, I can't hear anything at all. The same goes for the night time. I'm unable to process any acoustic inputs at night. I'm still hearing impaired despite my CIs, and I think that's an important message to get out there. CIs don't provide us with normal hearing. Hearing despite deafness is the motto of the self-help organization, the German Cochlear Implant Society where Michael Schwaninger is vice president. He has made it a personal aim to inform and advise people on cochlear implants. In his free time, he advises people with hearing impairments, 
explaining the capabilities and limits of sea eyes. New horizons have opened up in his private life as well. His wife Elka also wears two sea eyes. They met five years ago while being consulted about cochlear implants. Their daughter Emily has normal hearing. That was not a given, as neither of her parents know just why they began to go deaf as children. A hospital hearing screening just after her birth clarified things for Emily. Such a hearing screening is recommended for all newborn babies, as one in a thousand children is born with a hearing impairment. Every year, about 5,000 adults go deaf, but fewer than 2,000 cochlear implants are performed. Luckily, a new world has opened up for the Schwaninger family. Elephant researcher Ian Douglas Hamilton studies the migration routes of elephants in Kenya, which can cover up to 25 kilometers in a day. But how are hearing and elephants connected? Clearly, elephants have ears, and not little ones either. But that's not what it's about today. We're interested in an elephant's weight, and this is hardly a lightweight matter. An animal like this can weigh in at 5,000 kilograms. At the other end of the scale, a corn of rice is just 0.02 grams. And to bring a sense of proportion to this matter, an elephant weighs as much as 200 million corns of rice. Ah, oh, well and good, you say. But what does that have to do with our ears? Well, the elephant to rice comparison shows what a remarkable thing our hearing is, and here's how. If our organs were weighing scales, then, without having to change ranges, we could weigh an elephant and corn rice precisely. A fascinating picture because no such instrument has ever been crafted by mankind. You either have small scales for lighter weight, such as at a dispensary, or one for elephantine masses, such as a vehicle. But who would ever think of weighing a rice corn on scales built for vehicles, or of going round to the dispensary with a dieting elephant? And yet, in terms of range, this is exactly what our ears do. We can hear the faint buzzing of a bee, and also withstand a jet at takeoff. But exactly why elephants have such big ears? Well, we'll explain that one in the next link. On the way to the Samburu National Reserve in the dry climate of northern Kenya. The zoologist Ian Douglas Hamilton is coming here to study the migration of elephants. Around 900 elephants live in this region, a great many considering the size of the reservation. The animals often cross the park boundaries, thus expanding their habitat. There's a lot that's still unknown about their wandering habits. For years now, Ian Douglas Hamilton has been trying to find out why they're constantly on the move. What we're trying to find out in our tracking program is how elephants take decisions. And from learning how they view their habitat, we can understand their needs. If we understand their needs, then we can help find a future for them. Elephants will walk until they find water often for many kilometers. If necessary, they'll visit a different place every year. On average, they cover up to 25 kilometers per day. The Ivaso Nguro River is a lifeline for the Samburu National Reserve. Now, just after the rainy season, it carries enough water and the elephants don't need to leave the area. David Dabalan is the head of field research at the Samburu Reserve. Of the 900 elephants that wander through the protected area, he can recognize 500 by sight. Today, he's studying a 40-strong elephant herd. Two of the herd are fitted with transmitters, enabling David Dabalan to locate them. He gathers data on their daily routines. Which elephants play together? How long do they bathe and what do they eat? They think for security, they think for, you know, where they can get food, where it's safe for them. Um, you know, social life, you know, they need to be together with other elephants. They think like any other species like us. So the reasons why elephants migrate 
seems obvious. Although there remain some unresolved questions. How do the elephants know which way to go and where can they find water and food? Ian Douglas Hamilton keeps in constant contact with his elephants. There are currently 20 elephants fitted with transmitters. The latest model gives an hourly update on the location of the animals. Now you see these guys mm. down in Lycipia. Mm. Yeah. This little fellow was once upon a time a, a quiet elephant who never went outside the ranch. But recently, judging from this map here, you can see that he's crossing at night into the small holding farms. The elephants have very definite paths when they want to get from one place to another. We call them corridors. So if they want to really move range, then they go along a path or several paths. But the elephants are losing range to agricultural people who are moving into the elephant range, putting up fences and having conflict. Ian Douglas Hamilton hopes that his research data will contribute to protecting the elephants. Because once he knows their migration routes, confrontations with humans can be avoided. If this fails, the future of the gentle giants does not look very bright. Lots of danger, ever-present danger. The greatest danger is that human beings may displace elephants completely because we cannot control our own population or demands on this planet. So it's a battle for people's hearts and minds as well as conserving animals and studying them out here in the field. Ian Douglas Hamilton will keep fighting to ensure that elephants have a safe place on our planet. Ever since the accident at Fukushima, it's become clear that nuclear power stations have to be built to withstand earthquakes. They undergo the first safety checks in the planning phase. But what's the link between elephants and nuclear power stations? We all know that electricity comes out of sockets. But where does it originate? It's a job undertaken by power stations that are spread across the countryside. Many of these power stations have massive cooling towers, and these cooling towers do something we at home would never dream of doing. We wouldn't switch on the heating and then open a window. That's just wasting heat. So why were these cooling towers built? To warm the environment? The reason is to be found as far back as 1824, when there weren't any cooling towers. Nicolas Sadi Carnot was a French officer and scientist. He found that no energy could be extracted from a machine driven by heat without some of that heat being lost. If you want to get work out, then you lose some heat. There's no way around it. And that holds true for elephants. Standing in the hot African sun, they too need to give off heat into the environment so that they don't overheat. And they do that through their ears, which they flap about. It's why the ears of African elephants are larger than those of their Indian cousins. Africa is hotter. Looked at like that, an elephant's ears and a power station's cooling towers are pretty much the same thing. How can nuclear power stations be protected against earthquakes? Seismic measurements, historical sources and geological studies form the basis of this map, which is used as a reference for large construction projects in Germany. It shows all the known earthquakes that have occurred in the last 1,200 years and their magnitude. The map is relevant for operators of nuclear power plants too. These structures must be built to withstand earthquakes of equivalent strength to all those over the last 1,200 years. The earthquakes that could occur in Germany exceed the design specifications of all our nuclear power plants. Some of them aren't earthquake-proof at all, and some are only able to withstand weak or medium-strength earthquakes, but none are designed to withstand a strong earthquake. The risk? Earthquakes. In Germany, all nuclear power stations are subjected to safety checks in the planning phase. Various theoretical scenarios are simulated on a computer, as demonstrated by this nuclear reactor manufacturer. What effect does an earthquake have on the building? What systems react to an earthquake and how? 
What effect does an earthquake have that only lasts a few seconds, or one lasting several minutes? Nuclear power stations are subjected to regular checks covering every possible area. Various seismic and geological studies are carried out too, although our situation is relatively stable. It's crucial that all the systems remain operational following an earthquake so that the reactor can be safely shut down. Raw plugs have to meet specific standards so they don't fall out of the walls. Pipes and electrical cables networks must remain intact. And most importantly, the structure itself must not collapse, or concrete debris could end up in the cooling tanks. We have power stations that can withstand magnitude 6 to 6.5 and others that can withstand up to 7.5. As a rule, our design specifications are conservative, which means they actually have higher tolerances. That's completely untrue. If we examine the design data of the Gronde power station, for example, then we see it's able to withstand a magnitude 4 to 5 earthquake at the most. Ultimately, the way that power stations are built and how safe they are in the case of earthquakes depends on the knowledge and expertise of the geoscientists. Fukushima was struck by an earthquake that very few people thought possible. And it now seems less unlikely that a similar accident could happen elsewhere in the world. Ensuring the safety of existing nuclear power stations has become a top priority. A recent series of stress tests concluded that most of Europe's nuclear reactors require safety retrofits. Within the EU, 14 of the 27 member states rely on nuclear power. An invasion of crabs on the banks of the River Elbe, south of Hamburg. Thousands of these creatures are scurrying along the rocks. But where have they come from? And what do crabs have to do with power stations? The home of the mitten crab was originally the Middle Kingdom, in other words, China. In the middle of the 20th century, it came to Europe as a stowaway in the ballast tanks of ships. Initially, the crabs had a tough time in Europe establishing a new home, as the climate really wasn't to their liking. It was a bit too cold for them. But after a while, the mitten crabs got used to it and settled down as happy immigrants in their new surroundings. Expressed scientifically, the mitten crab is a neozoon. But for biologists, this crab is a pain in the lab, because this crab is, to put it mildly, an alpha type, dominant. It's spreading so quickly that the indigenous species are getting pushed out. One big factor helping the newcomer is the rising water temperature. The mitten crab reproduces faster in warmer water. And where is warm water to be found? Where power stations use rivers for their cooling water. It's here that massive populations of mitten crabs are to be found, and they're not just here for a warm weekend. To the cost of European species, the changing climate and rising temperatures go hand in hand with the rise of the mitten crab. As to their old homeland of China, well, that's a long forgotten memory. The Larsh Lake in Lower Saxony. Fisherman Christian Kurtka has a good idea what's in store for him today. Every day he rides out to check his weirs. It's a routine job. Although this is an eel fishing area, the catches are modest and Kurtka wouldn't normally have to empty the nets every day. However, he can't afford to skip a day. The consequences would be disastrous. In these waters, an exotic invader is causing havoc with the local ecosystem, the Chinese mitten crab. These little monsters have a huge appetite. It's terrible. The mitten crabs eat my nets, the fish are often dead and the eels get eaten by them too. It's an absolute disaster. Kurtka's catch contains more crabs than eels and their numbers are increasing. But he believes he knows where the root of the problem lies. We want to put up a mitten crab barrier at the weir in Geesthacht. We could catch the crabs there and dispose of them in order to reduce their population. The Elbe Barrage at Geesthacht, 30 kilometers south of Hamburg. The fast-flowing currents here prevent the crabs from migrating upstream. But something incredible is happening. In their determination to overcome this obstacle, the crabs climb out of the water. Hundreds of thousands of them clamber onto the shore, marching relentlessly along the banks. 
Mitten crabs undermine shorelines and dams. They cause extensive damage and can even be a safety risk. Mitten crabs reproduce at an alarming rate. And in Germany, their numbers are already in the millions. And their territory is expanding constantly. But how did this crab species make it all the way from China to Europe? The trail leads to the giant ocean vessels in Germany's ports. Marine biologist Dr. Stefan Golasch studies the migration routes of invasive marine species. He's heading for the tanks of ballast water of a large ship. A suspicion leads him deeper into the belly of the ship. The scientist climbs down the slippery ladder. The air is hot and stifling, almost unbearable. Golash climbs down further and further. He has to reach the floor of the tank. He takes a sediment sample for analysis in the lab. Scientists often find more than they bargain for. We found many types of toxic algae which are being carried around the world. Bacteria, viruses and even cholera bacteria have been found in ballast tanks. Ballast water helps stabilize the ship. Before a ship embarks on a voyage, its tanks of ballast water are filled and the water is released again at the destination port and with it the stowaways. An enormous amount of organisms arrive in our coastal waters from ballast tanks. Based on the results of our ship study in the 1990s, we calculated that there were over 500 zooplankton organisms. That's the animals that live in the water. Just counting those alone, it makes over 500 per second the whole year around. The mass invasion has to be tackled at source, and ballast water has to be subjected to strict controls. But what about the invaders that have already arrived and have established themselves here? Can the growing population of mitten crabs be exploited? In China, the animals are a delicacy, but due to poor water quality, they're becoming rare in their home country. We had an American company here that was exporting the mitten crabs to China. But they have to be alive when they get there. They have to be transported live, and that's the basic problem. While the crabs reproduce rapidly in the wild, they get sick when kept in captivity. During transportation, they produce a secretion that makes them inedible. But if this problem can be overcome, the crab plague might turn into a golden business opportunity. <laughs>